Chapter 41 John You are as hopeless as any boys I have ever trained, Sir Alistair Thorne announced when they had all assembled in the yard. Your hands were made for manure shovels, not for swords, and if it were up to me, the lot of you would be set to herd and swine. But last night I was told that Garin is marching five new boys up the King's Road. One or two may even be worth the price of piss. To make room for them, I have decided to pass eight of you on to the Lord Commander to do with as he will. He called out the names one by one. Toad! Stonehead! Oryx! Lava! Pimple! Monkey! Sir Loon! Last, he looked at John. And the bastard. Pip let fly a whoop and thrust his sword into the air. Sir Alistair fixed him with a reptile stare. They will call you men of the night's watch now. But you are bigger fools than the mummer's monkey here, if you believe that. You are boys still, green and stinking of summer. And when the winter comes, you will die like flies. And with that... Sir Alistair Thorne took his leave of them. The other boys gathered around the eight who had been named, laughing and cursing and offering congratulations. Halder smacked Toad on the butt with the flat of his sword and shouted, Toad of the Night's Watch! Yelling that a black brother needed a horse, Pip leapt onto Gren's shoulders, and they tumbled to the ground, rolling and punching and hooting. Darien dashed inside the armory and returned with a skin of sour red. As they passed the wine from hand to hand, grinning like fools, John noticed Samuel Tarley standing by himself beneath a bare dead tree in the corner of the yard. John offered him the skin. A swallow of wine? Sam shook his head. No, thank you, John. Are you well? Very well, truly, the fat boy lied. I'm so happy for you all. His round face quivered as he forced a smile. You will be first ranger some day, just as your uncle was. Is, John corrected. He would not accept that Benjamin Stark was dead. Before he could say any more, Halder cried, Hey, you planning to drink that all yourself? Pip snatched the skin from his hand and danced away, laughing. While Gren seized his arm, Pip gave the skin a squeeze, and a thin stream of red squirted John in the face. Halder howled in protest at the good waste of wine, at the waste of good wine. John sputtered and struggled. Mathar and Jaren climbed the wall and began pelting them all with snowballs. By the time he wrenched free with snow in his hair and wine stains on his surcoat, Samuel Tarley had gone. That night, Three Finger Hob cooked the boys a special meal to mark the occasion. When John arrived at the common hall, the Lord Steward himself led him to the bench near the fire. The older men clapped him on the arm in passing. The eight soon-to-be brothers feasted on a rack of lamb, baked in a crust of garlic and herbs, garnished with sprigs of mint and surrounded by mashed yellow turnips swimming in butter. From the Lord Commander's own table, Bowen Marsh told them. There were salads of spinach and chickpeas and turnip greens, and afterward bowls of iced blueberries and sweet cream. You think they'll keep us together? Pip wondered as they gorged themselves happily. Toad made a face. I hope not. I'm sick of looking at those ears of yours. Oh, said Pip. Listen to the crow call the raven black. You're certain to be a ranger, Toad. They'll want you as far from the castle as they can. If Mance Raider attacks, lift your visor and show your face and he'll run off screaming. Everyone laughed but Gren. I hope I'm a ranger. Yeah, you and everyone else, said Mathar. Every man who wore the black walked the wall, and every man was expected to take up steel in its defense. But the rangers were the true fighting heart of the night's watch. It was they who dared ride beyond the wall, sweeping through the haunted forest and the icy mountains west of the Shadow Tower, fighting wildlings and giants and monstrous snow bears. Not everyone, said Halder. It's the builders for me. What use would rangers be if the wall fell down? The Order of Builders provided the masons and carpenters to repair keeps and towers, the miners to dig tunnels and crush stone for roads and footpaths, the woodsmen to clear away new growth wherever the forest pressed too close to the wall. Once, it was said, they had quarried immense blocks of ice from frozen lakes deep in the haunted forest, dragging them south on sledges so the wall might be raised ever higher. 
Those days were centuries gone, however. Now, it was all they could do to ride the wall from East Watch to the Shadow Tower, watching for cracks or signs of melt and making what repairs they could. The old bear's no fool, Darian observed. He's certain to be a builder, and John's certain to be a ranger. He's the best sword and the best rider among us, and his uncle was the first before he... His voice trailed off awkwardly as he realized what he had almost said. Benjamin Stark is still first ranger, Jon Snow told him, toying with his bowl of blueberries. The rest might have given up all hope of his uncle's safe return, but not him. He pushed away the berries, scarcely touched, and rose from the bench. Aren't you going to eat those? Toad asked. They're yours. Jon had hardly tasted Hop's great feast. I could not eat another bite. He took his clothes from, his, from its hook near the door and shouldered his way out. Pip followed him. John, what is it? Sam, he admitted. He was not at table tonight. It's not like him to miss a meal, Pip said thoughtfully. You suppose he's taken ill? He's frightened. We're leaving him. He remembered the day he had left Winterfell. All the bittersweet farewells, Bran lying broken, Rob with snow in his hair... Arya raining kisses on him after he'd given her needle. Once we say our words, we'll all have duties to attend to. Some of us may be sent away to East Watch or the Shadow Tower. Sam will remain in training with the likes of Rast and Cudger and these new boys who are coming up the King's Road. Gods only know what they'll be like, but you can bet Sir Alistair will send them against him first chance he gets. Pip made a grimace. You did all you could. All we could wasn't enough, John said. A deep restlessness was on him as he went back to Harden's tower for Ghost. The direwolf walked beside him to the stables. Some of the more skittish horses kicked at their stalls and laid back their ears as they entered. John saddled his mare, mounted, and rode out from Castle Black, south across the moonlit night. Ghost raced ahead of him, flying over the ground, gone in the bleak of an eye. John let him go. A wolf needed to hunt. He had no destination in mind. He wanted only to ride. He followed the creek for a time, listening to the icy trickle of water over rock, then cut across the fields to the King's Road. It stretched out before him, narrow and stony and pocked with weeds, a road of no particular promise, yet the sight of it filled Jon Snow with a vast longing. Winterfell was down that road and beyond it River Run and King's Landing and the Erie and so many other places, Casterly Rock, the Isle of Faces, the Red Mountains of Dorne, the Hundred Islands of Bravos and the Sea, the Smoking Ruins of Old Valyria, all the places that John would never see. The world was down that road, and he was here. Once he swore his vow, the wall would be his home until he was as old as Maester Aemon. I've not sworn yet, he muttered. He was no outlaw, bound to take the black or pay the penalty for his crimes. He had come here freely, and he might leave freely, until he said the words. He need only ride on, and he could leave it all behind. By the time the moon was full again, he would be back in Winterfell with his brothers. Your half-brothers, a voice inside reminded him, and Lady Stark, who will not welcome you. There was no place for him in Winterfell, no place in King's Landing either. Even his own mother had not had a place for him. The thought of her made him sad. He wondered who she had been, what she had looked like, why his father had left her. Because she was a whore or an adulterous fool, something dark and dishonorable, or else why was Lord Eddard too ashamed to speak of her? Jon Snow turned away from the King's Road to look behind him. The fires of Castle Black were hidden behind a hill, but the wall was there, pale beneath the moon, vast and cold running from horizon to horizon. He wheeled his horse around and started for home. Ghost returned as he crested a rise and saw the distant glow of lamplight from the Lord Commander's tower. The direwolf's muzzle was red with blood as he trotted beside the horse. John found himself thinking of Samuel Tarley again on the ride back. By the time he reached the stables, he knew what he must do. Maester Eamon's apartments were in a stout wooden keep below the rookery. Aged and frail, the maester shared his chambers with two of the younger stewards, who tended to his needs and helped him in his duties. The brothers joked that he had been given the two ugliest men in the night's watch. Being blind, he was spared having to look at them. 
Clytus was short, bald, and chinless, with small pink eyes like a mole. Chet had a wen on his neck the size of a pigeon's egg, and a face red with boils and pimples. Perhaps that was why he always seemed so angry. It was Chet who answered John's knock. I need to speak to Maester Eamon, John told him. The Maester is a bed, as you should be. Come back on the morrow and maybe he'll see you. He began to shut the door. John jammed it open with his boot. I need to speak to him now. The morning will be too late. Chet scowled. The maester is not accustomed to being woken in the night. Do you know how old he is? Old enough to treat visitors with more courtesy than you, John said. Give him my pardons. I would not disturb his rest if it were not important. And if I refuse? John had his boot wedged solidly in the door. I can stand here all night if I must. The black brother made a disgusted noise and opened the door to admit him. Wait in the library. There's wood. Start a fire. I want the maester catching a chill on account of you. John had the logs crackling merrily by the time Chet let in Maester Eamon. The old man was clad in his bedrobe, but around his throat was the chain collar of his order. A maester did not remove it even to sleep. The chair beside the fire would be pleasant, he said when he felt the warmth on his face. When he was settled comfortably, Chet covered his legs with a fur and went to stand by the door. I'm sorry to have woken you, Maester, Jon Snow said. You did not wake me, Maester Eamon replied. I find I need less sleep as I grow older, and I'm grown very old. I often spend half the night with ghosts, remembering times fifty years past as if they were yesterday. The mystery of a midnight visitor is a welcome diversion. So tell me, Jon Snow, why have you come calling at this strange hour? To ask that Samuel Tarley be taken from training and accepted as a brother of the Night's Watch. This is no concern of Maester Eamon, Chet complained. Our Lord Commander has given the training of recruits into the hands of Sir Alistair Thorne, the maester said gently. Only he may say when a boy is ready to swear his vow, as you surely know. Why then come to me? The Lord Commander listens to you, John told him, and the wounded and the sick of the night's watch are in your charge. And is your friend Samwell wounded or sick? He will be. John promised, unless you help. He told them all of it, even the part where he'd set ghost at Rast's throat. Maester Eamon listened silently, blind eyes fixed on the fire, but Chet's face darkened with each word. Without us to keep him safe, Sam will have no chance, John finished. He's hopeless with a sword. My sister Arya could tear him apart, and she's not yet ten. If Sir Alistair makes him fight, it's only a matter of time before he's hurt or killed. Chet could stand no more. I've seen this fat boy in the common hall, he said. He is a pig, and a hopeless craven as well, if what you say is true. Maybe it is so, Maester Eamon said. Tell me, Chet, what would you have us do with such a boy? Leave him where he is, Chet said. The wall is no place for the weak. Let him train until he is ready. No matter how many years that takes, Sir Alistair shall make a man of him or kill him as the gods will. That's stupid, John said. He took a deep breath to gather his thoughts. I remember once I asked Maester Lewin why he wore a chain around his throat. Maester Eamon touched his own collar lightly, his bony, wrinkled fingers stroking the heavy metal links. Go on. He told me that a maester's collar is made of a chain to remind him that he is sworn to serve, John said, remembering. I asked why each link was a different metal. A silver chain would look much finer with his gray robes, I said. Maester Lewin laughed. A maester forges his chain with study, he told me. The different metals are each a different kind of learning. Gold for the study of money and accounts, silver for healing, iron for warcraft. And he said there were other meanings as well. A collar is supposed to remind a maester of the realm he serves. Isn't that so? Lords are gold and knights steel, but two links can't make a chain. You also need silver and iron and lead, tin and copper and bronze and all the rest. And those are farmers and smiths and merchants and the like. 
A chain needs all sorts of metals, and a land needs all sorts of people. Maester Aemon smiled. And so? The Night's Watch needs all sorts, too. Why else have rangers and stewards and builders? Lord Randall couldn't make Sam a warrior, and Sir Alistair won't either. You can't hammer tin into iron, no matter how hard you beat it. But that doesn't mean Tim is useless. tin is useless. Why shouldn't Sam be a steward? Chet gave an angry scowl. I'm a steward. You think it's easy work? Fit for cowards? The order of stewards keeps the watch alive. We hunt and farm, tend the horses, milk the cows, gather firewood, cook the meals. Who do you think makes your clothing? Who brings up supplies from the south? The stewards. Maester Aemon was gentler. Is your friend a hunter? He hates hunting, John had to admit. Can he plow a field? The maester asked. Can he drive a wagon or sail a ship? Could he butcher a cow? No. Chet gave a nasty laugh. I've seen what happens to soft lordlings when they're put to work. Send them to churning butter and their hands blister and bleed. Give them an axe to split logs and they cut off their own foot. I know one thing Sam could do better than anyone. Yes, Maester Eamon prompted. John glanced warily at Chet, standing beside the door, his boils red and angry. He could help you, he said quickly. He can do sums, and he knows how to read and write. I know Chet can't read, and Clytus has weak eyes. Sam read every book in his father's library. He'd be good with the ravens, too. Animals seemed to like him. Ghosts took to him straight off. There's a lot he could do, besides fighting. The Night's Watch needs every man... Why kill one to no end? Make use of him instead. Maester Eamon closed his eyes, and for a brief moment, John was afraid that he had gone to sleep. Finally, he said, Maester Lewin taught you well, John Snow. Your mind is as deft as your blade, it would seem. Does that mean... It means I shall think on what you have said, the maester said firmly. And now... I believe I am ready to sleep. Chet, show our young brother to the door.